sit down and we're gonna have some time of poetry. It's going to be beautiful. So join us, sit down, take a breath, and here we are. Okay. Hello everyone, welcome to PMP Live. My name is Hannah and I'm Programs Coordinator here at Politics and Prose. I do many of the classes. And so if you ever wanna know about that, you can always shoot us an email, but thank you for joining us today. Actually, as a random comment, Sandra, who's coming up later, is one of our instructors, random tie-in. But anyway, thank you for joining us. We are having lovely Sandra Beasley and Terry Ellen Cross Davis here today. They are wonderful authors, and each of us, each of them, are going to be talking about their books today. Terry, Terry Ellen Cross Davis did this one right here. It is a more perfect union, and then there's also Made to Explode by Sandra Beasley. Sandra Beasley is the author of four poetry collections, including I Was the Jukebox, winner of the Bernard Women's Poets Prize, and Theories of Falling, winner of the New Issues Poetry Prize. She is also the author of the memoir, Don't Kill the Birthday Girl, Tales from an Allergic Life. Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of Hain It, and I believe I said that right, otherwise she can correct me later. Um, and she can tell you all what it actually is. Um, but it is a winner of the 2017 Oeana Book, Pri Book Award for Poetry. And she is a Cave Hanneman Fellow and a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective. Goodness, as you can tell, I used to work at the Children and Teens. I can pronounce their awards. I'm gonna work on the adult awards. Um, she is also the poetry coordinator for the for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Both of these books are truly amazing, and they intersperse moments of the American experience and what it means to be an American in this country. In just a moment, we are going to go and have them talk to us and read their poetry for us. It's going to be truly lovely. But before we hit that, we're going to go through a couple things in this format. You can always ask a question, just click the ask a question below button, and then you can pop in your question there. The one thing that we ask is that it does relate to the author and the books and the things that we talk about today. The other thing that you should know is that if you click in the chat box, it's also down there, you can click and you can get your own copies of both Made to Explode and um, A More Perfect Union. So either way, you can always get those in your own collection. Now, I am going to hand this off to Terry and Sandra. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much, Hannah. Um, Terry, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm gonna kick things off. Uh, for those who are tuning in, uh, welcome. We are so glad that you've stolen a little bit of time out of this beautiful Sunday uh, for some Easter Sunday here in DC. And I just want to thank uh, Politics and Prose for hosting us, thank Hannah and, and the whole team. And I just wanna say how delighted I am to be joined by Terry Ellen Cross Davis, uh, author of Haint, um, which I have taught in my own classrooms uh, and a distinguished scholar and, and force of nature here in DC. So Terry, let me just check in with you briefly. Like, are we good? So shall I kick things off and, and then we'll, we'll throw it back to you? Yes, I'm seeing yeah. from her. Okay, so just yeah. for those just tuning in, we're going to do it round robin style. So I'm going to read three poems. I'm actually going to do something I've never done before, which I'm going to read the opening three poems from the book. And then I will uh, move to, to Terry, who will speak about her amazing collection, A More Perfect Union. And then we'll, we'll kind of just see where the conversation flows from there, which I'm really excited about. Terry and I have known each other since uh, being workshop mates at in our days at American University as poets. And um, I feel like for both of us, these collections are important movements forward in terms of us articulating where we are as women in the world and uh, in very particularly the Beltway world, so to speak. So I'm going to read Heirloom, Elephant, and Long John Silvers, and just try to give a brief uh, touchstone for each. Um, Heirloom is inspired in part by my work with the Vinegar and Char Anthology for the Southern Foodways Alliance. When you are helping people edit and publishing their poems of food, you invariably turn to the poems you yourself wish were there or that you yourself would write. In my case, it was thinking about foods that were not 
painstakingly cooked over many hours, foods that were convenient, processed, straight out of the freezer. And in this particular case, you will hear the origin story of a very particular product. I wish we could all be sharing them physically on Connecticut Avenue at Politics and Prose right now, but uh, you'll just have to imagine the tater tot for the sake of this uh, context. All of my tater tot facts, totally true. Heirloom, low. 12 children born to a woman named Thankful in Nampa by the border between Oregon and Idaho, or as it will be remembered, or Ida. Lo, two of her sons drive to Miami, not knowing if their plan will work. Lo, what were once waste scraps fed to the cows, now repackage the fry shavings sliced, spiced, and oiled. Lo, a chef at the Fontainebleau takes the bribe. Lo, tater tots are dished onto the tables of the 1954 National Potato Convention and soon enshrined in the freezers of America. Three decades later, the golden age of my childhood is a foil lined tray plattered with Orida product, maybe salt, maybe nothing but hot anticipation of my fingertips. Lo, my mother is a great cook and lo, my grandmother is a terrible one, but on tinfoil planes, they are equal. I need you to understand why my father will never enjoy an heirloom tomato glistening layered in basil. Put away your brandy wines, your Cherokee purples, your green zebras. Lo, as with spinach, as with olives, he tastes only the claustrophobia his mother unleashed from cans to feed four children on a budget. We talk little of this. Lo, what is cooked to mush. Lo, what is peppered to ash. Lo, the flavor rendered as morning chore, that this too is a form of love. So as I alluded to uh, for some folks before, you know, I'm, I grew up in Northern Virginia. I'm in DC right now. My, my dad and my husband are playing golf over on Haynes Point. Uh, my mom is out on the balcony. I, I am deeply here. I am deeply geographic to DC area. And um, this next poem, which is called Elephant, draws on my father's military background. Like many, we lived in the radius of the Pentagon for a number of years uh, specific to that. Um, it also mentions a, a very specific strip mall of shops in Route 7 near what is now known as the behemoth of Tyson's Corner, but was uh, once upon a time a relatively sleepy uh, area of, of Virginia, Northern Virginia. Elephant. On the Route 7 strip, next to the office supply store, next to the pool supply store, next to the Tower Records, next to the TJ Maxx, the Ranger surplus lurked, where I shopped only at the edges. Iron-on patches, all-weather lighters, vintage plate pinups, never venturing into the groin of camouflage or camping gear, until I began buying weapons, including a mace, a chain flail, several throwing stars, and the book Contemporary Surveillance Techniques, with its cover art showing a man crouched in a stereo speaker. All gifts for my father, because what do you get the man who has everything? And by everything, I mean a large caliber shell casing, upright and decorative in the living room where you might expect a potted ficus to be. And these two were the years he gave me t-shirt after t-shirt, souvenirs of every posting and deployment, including the one that said, Hard Rock Cafe Baghdad, closed, Kuwait, now reopening. T-shirts that fit poorly over my new breasts, boxy, unflattering. And so I shut them away in drawers again 
And again, each of us trying to say to the other, I see you. The way a blindfolded man takes the tail into his hands, believing from this, he can see the whole elephant. So um, I will pause uh, with just reading one more poem for now, uh, Long John Silver's. And you know, the first poem I read touched upon my, my grandma Peggy from Texas. Uh, this touches upon my grandparents from Illinois, Jean and Carl. Um, one thing that Terry and I know have dialogued about quite a bit is, is reclaiming our grandparents' generation in poetry, not letting anyone tell us it's sentimental, but understanding us and instead that it's essential. Um, but it also, importantly, uh, references Long John Silver's, a uh, chain of seafood shops that might be familiar to some of you. Long John Silver's. Once again, at the Long John Silver's of 1988, the rope slung walkway seems to sway under my feet as I look up at the Cape Cod with its steepled roof trimmed in yellow and lean my whole weight to the wrought iron sword that serves as a door handle. At the counter, I order a fish filet served in a folded paper treasure chest with a handful of fries to hide the secret compartment. Hold the hush puppies corn cob on the side. I carry the blue plastic tray with care to a booth paneled in the mahogany of an officer's quarters, then sit on a bench vinyled like a nautical flag. The batter is always fluffy with club soda and here no one has died yet. My teeth cut a smile into the Icelandic cod and perhaps I will go back to order a chicken plank or a tray of crunchies swept from the briar, friar's belly, which they will give me for free. When I look back on all I've done, I want to be the person stubborn enough to found a chain of seafood shops in Lexington, Kentucky, 500 miles from any ocean, named for a character in a Scottish novel. I want to admit I'm doubled over and howling, yet reach up to ring the captain's bell on my way out. Thank you. And I turn it over to Terry to introduce us to this amazing collection, A More Perfect Union. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you to Politics and Prose, to Hannah, to, um, to everyone at Politics and Prose for making this happen. Um, it's such a joy to read with Sandra. Our work has been like just to have known each other for as long as we've known each other and then just to have seen just from out the bat, you're putting out great work. So it's, it's you know, it's very exciting. Um, you mentioned a lot of themes, so I'm going to jump around. Uh, with these first three and start off with this one because when you bring up fathers and you talked about the t-shirt, you'll you'll hear the, the, the conversation. This is called Houses of the Holy, Led Zeppelin album cover. In this temple of bare bottoms and breast buds, my ears follow the steps of the guitar, each chord progression a gospel raising the hair on my arms. Is this what I'm supposed to feel in church? But it's Saturday, and music is exploding from the speakers in the living room. These white boys can rock, Daddy says, strumming baby sister's belly, her giddy laughter, an improvised solo. Spinning and twirling in this carpeted pulpit, the whites of my father's eyes on fire, sweat pouring down his face, reverb shaking the house. I am spinning too, blessed by rock and roll. And so if we begin to talk about food, food makes an interesting appearance um, in a more perfect union. And it's through blackberries. Um, <laughs> I travel from one continent to an, to an island and to another continent. 
Um, so this is blackberries and it's in three parts. The first part, Whidbey Island, Washington. Leave it to the 70 year old black woman, her honey skin glowing to tell me where the best blackberries grow on this island in the Puget Sound. Reaching into the circular bushes, cautious of the cane's red thorns, I hunt for the blackest berry. A ripeness betrayed by fattened droplets, skin near bursting, purple streaking my fingers up to the elbows. Nature shows her work, clusters on biennial vines. No, the tender ones won't satisfy, persists. Let your fingertips stroke the yielding weight of sweetness, a near hidden whisper of a kiss, blood berries, joyful and round, dapple in luster of late afternoon sun. Two, Limerick, Ireland. The blacker the berry, the sweeter the juice, I told my Irish friend, his speckled hand reaching deeper into a homegrown bush of currants, searching for the ripest for his black American guest. The young ones, a blushed violet, bled streaks on his cream fingers, but he kept pushing past crimson, past crimson, dark garnet until sweet midnight unveiled itself. The intermittent sun shed ribbons of yellow light over the river Shannon. The swimming swan's tragedy, a soul surviving gosling, all eclipsed by the black current, its tender rupture on the hilt of my tongue. Three, Mombasa, Kenya. With long braids and dark skin, few knew I wasn't Kenyan. Here, melanin was a blessing. The batik bikini, baby oil, equatorial sun. How black could I get? I never burned. Only burnished strains of buttermilk blocking anything deeper. I could not have done this in the States. I would never call it tanning, having never been tanned. But in Mombasa, drunk on a camel, crossing the spilling evening sand, ocean surf my cover band, I chased my color, taunted it to come out and play. And as we talk about the South and we talk about food, um, one of the elements of a more perfect union, I created my own goddesses and just nine goddesses, which you know, that nine for a specific reason. Um, but this is one of those goddesses and this is goddess of the South. And for me, so much of my, like so much of what I've learned about Southern culture, being a transplanted Southerner, I like to say, born and raised in Cleveland, will always claim Cleveland, but my mother being born and raised in Little Rock, my uh, paternal grandparents being raised in Bessemer, Alabama, and so much just extended family um, from Arkansas. I, I've just been immersed in the South, even though I grew up with snow. Um, so here is the goddess of the South. I'm Mama, telling you the best way to rid them pimples was to wash your face with fresh morning urine. I'm there when your mama teaches you how to pick chitlins, small fingers finding bits of straw and bone until a full bucket cooks down to one plate. I was in your mother's hand and she rounded your head as a baby, them soft spots shifting into the curve of her palm. I'm sugar, bacon, soda, cornmeal, and the cast iron skillet when your great aunt shows you how to make cornbread from scratch. I'm every bite of peach cobbler you sneak even though you allergic to peaches. Remember how you ain't no Bessemer was Bessemer until a road trip to Atlanta bought you in shouting distance of Alabama? or Auntie Surly's real name was Sarah Lee. How I dragged your northern tongue, taught it to linger in the soft boughs, the syrup of me thick like alaga in your mouth. I'm in every shotgun story you know. Like that time you and your sister heard that rattle when y'all was playing in the tall grass near Auntie Surly's juke joint. Mm-hmm, how matter of fact and fluid that big woman was putting a plate of freshly fried chicken in front of y'all with one hand, grabbing her shotgun with the other and kept it stepping. But I evolved too, baby. My young preachers keep me so fresh and so clean. I glean in the grits you pour butter and yes, sugar, cause I do as you do my beautiful brown children. When you spread to California, Wisconsin, New York, Illinois and Ohio, you take me with you. You make neck bones. Teach your children how to work hard for such sweet little meat. You cut rabbit chunks into your oxtail soup 
You house the children of this cousin, that daughter, this sister, and raise them as your own, arms always extended in a net of family of blood. How I groomed you, child, let you overhear, she ain't got a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. And what you getting a giddy up is what you getting a round up. I'm always at your table. The hot sauce you want on Friday's fried fish, that hankering for smothered pork chops you get on dreary November days, I lecture you in your sleep. When the shuddering of past relatives show up, you wake, knowing it's been a visitation. If you tell your mama, she gonna reach for the numbers book. I keep one of your feet planted firmly in my red clay, be it Little Rock, Pine Bluff, or Crisp County, Georgia. With honeyed names like Nay, Cousin Peaches, Grease, Junebug, I keep your mind running in circles, connecting blood to family, friends, and back. Baby girl, You'll never be free of me. All the black bodies I've consumed. Y'all's blood makes the soil shine. The roots of your family tree may shift so some of the dirt falls across the Mason-Dixon line, but I will always claim you as mine, mine, mine. If you ever change your mind about leaving, leaving me behind. All right, so I'm gonna kick it back over to you, Sandra. Oh man. Uh that is such an amazing series. You know, I'm reminded Elizabeth Alexander has that great, I think it's called Talk Radio DC. Uh, you know, it talks about like the yes. healing properties, that first splash of morning urine. And mm -hmm. <laughs> it's such a funny, I remember when the Southern Foodways was like, so you're gonna include that in the food anthology. And I was like, yeah, because it's it's about it's about uh, modes of, of healing and nourishment. Um, I hope, I think those goddess poems are so amazing. And, and I hope, uh, you know, you've got another couple of great ones. I hope you read like the goddess of cleaning or the goddess of anger or somewhat. I just think um, for those of you who were not fortunate enough to tune in, Terry did a, a reading earlier in the season where some wonderful other poets read the goddess poems. And I just think those are gonna move forward as something in vote for many folks to come. Um, I had goddesses uh, reading goddesses. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> seriously, seriously. Uh, I want to read, uh, since, I, since I feel like I'm hunkering down right into it, I'm going to read uh, two poems that are about being in D.C. Um, one is a very short poem and one is a sestina. So um, a lot of people have asked me since January 6th, how is it? And for those of you who don't know, I, I literally live about six blocks from the National Mall. So for example, this fight to get the gating down, the security fencing down very much means, you know, the fight for us to have routes that we're used to taking either by foot or by car just around our neighborhood. Um, I'm very saddened by the, the recent loss of life with the latest attack on the Capitol. It's strange. It's, I, I take it for granted having grown up in this area where the identity of the capital city and where my neighborhood is are so neatly intertwined, uh, I find now it's, it's a very hard time to have literally the capital in constant view. This is called Little Love Poem. The 6 a.m. sun considers everything humming its way past the capital. I reheat yesterday's coffee Put lima beans into a pot. Ford hook, always Ford hook. Drizzle of olive oil, pinch of salt, shake of chili flakes. The chicken broth comes to boil for a minute before I cover, simmer. Soon he'll wake and I'll ask him to put a record on something with no words, bowls, spoons, a single twist, of pepper. So I would just remind folks that, especially for those of us in Southwest and Southeast, there, there are people who are just trying to live our lives uh, in the space that has been so fraught with um, unrest. And, and, I, and I just hope, I hope for the country that we get to a better state of that soon. The other one, poem I wanted to read in this space is uh, American Rome. I have been desperate to have a DC audience 
that would get all of the labyrinthine puns and uh, jokes embedded in the sestina. For those who don't know this form, you commit to six end words uh, in your first stanza, I guess I should say six end words, um, that then you have to repeat with every subsequent stanza. So you will hear words again and again, and part of the struggle or the challenge is to, to find ways to use them. Um, American Rome is very much about DC history of the last 40 years or so. It carries as its epigraph a dedication to Marion Shepelov Berry Jr., 1936 to 2014. And it opens with a, a very real experience I had when I visited Seattle, my very first time on the other coast of the country. Marion Berry, Jams of Washington State. I thought they were mocking this city. Take a mayor and boil his sugar down, spoon spreadable, sweet. We take presidents and run them in a game's fourth inning stretch. We take bullets and turn them to sea dogs. Remember that vote, that ballot? Sea dogs, dragons, stallions, express. The Washington Wizards was no more or less of a stretch. We waved gavels like wands in this city. We're the small town in which a president can plant some roses. Each time I sit down to try and say goodbye, all I write down is, dear city. My neighbor walks his dogs past a monument to a president's terrier, Fala forever bronzed. Washington has no J Street, no Z, yet the city maps a 10 to 50 states and a stretch of five blocks northeast metro track, a stretch named Puerto Rico Avenue. Bow down to the unmapped names, Chocolate City, Simple City. Ben serves up chili dogs through a riot, and Walter Washington is the first and last time the president picks our mayor. The truth is presidents come and go four or eight years at a stretch. Barry said, I'm yours for life, Washington. Emperor Marion, who could get down with Chuck Brown. Later reporters will dog his bitch set me up, his graft. Dear city, will you let me claim you as my city? To love you is to defy precedent. Your quadrants hustle like a pack of dogs around the hydrant capital. They stretch and paw, they yap and will not settle down. Traffic, the berry to Washington's jam. For city miles, Barry's motorcade stretched. We laid him among vice presidents down where the dogs seek Congress in Washington. Terry. Yes. So, okay. <laughs> As you read uh, Dear City, asking the city to let you love it, I will say I have asked this country to let me love it. Um, I have asked this country to love me. And it's still dot, dot, dot. Um, as a response right now, and I would like something a little more firm. So um, I'll start with this. Um, I was talking about this poem. This is called A Black Woman Gets a Window Seat on Aer Lingus. And Aer Lingus, um, it, it, most of you may know, is the most popular airline in and out of Ireland. Um, so I'll start with that. A black woman gets a window seat on Aer Lingus. Enough, Ireland. For all your lush effusion of color inside me blooms a masochistic loneliness. Give me the screws I know best, the policeman quick to test my yes sir as acidless, trigger the Midwest. Never on the Bible school test was this. Crucifixion kills, not nails into feet or wrists, but the weight borne upon the breast. You suffocate slowly in your own flesh. As I return to the upright cross of the US, I breathe easier, I breathe less. And I find it interesting to read that poem today, um, of all days. Um, and I was torn because I was like, I'm listening to you and I'm talking and thinking about 
love of a city and love of a country. And then also just thinking, well, what do I have that references DC? So I'm kind of torn between thank you, Jesus, or a more perfect union because one expresses hope and the other one just throws a little love out to DC. Read them both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to keep to like just two. Um, I might okay. I think I'm, I will go ahead and read a more perfect union. So it's Sunday. I'm sorry, people. I have to give you a little warning of adult language. There's just one, just just one word. But there are some things in here that that might trigger um, some other people. Um, so you've been warned, <laughs> a more perfect union. Dear America, when I say America, I mean white people, you need a new name. I respectfully decline to continue this narrative. Evolution is upon us like a kiss. My tongue twists, I'm getting sick from holding it. Massa, officer, with you fear is always a whip, a white lady calling 911. We grew up in the same house, cotton fields, colonial red bricks, plantation shutters. But in 2016, you shit the bed. Since then, my blue smoke, spirits singe my throat. Oblivion's a better dance partner. At least with her, I cough, but don't choke. Under your patriotic blanket lies a thorny bouquet. You market it well, so I miss the smell of copper, blood steady seeping down my wrist. The founding fathers bought bodies, but every day I'm the one asked for receipts. I breastfed the beast till it gnashed and took off running on its feet. Can I get store credit for my rage? A trade-in voucher for heartbreak? I'm not a white man with a gun. I can't chew up a school, church, or movie theater for Burger King, a little right-wing fun. America, are you listening? You need a new name. I cannot keep talking to myself when I am not talking about myself. But maybe America isn't who I need to talk to. Dear reader, we need to knuckle up. From old newspapers to online news, headlines excusing whiteness ain't failed to disappoint me yet. It's time for the remix. Let the masses DJ, not another oligarchy set. Be that more perfect union. And while the ink is still wet, make capitalism beg for forgiveness, forgive college debt. Establish a general income, make felons voting legit, write in healthcare. Not that Western mindset, but holistic. Meditate on that. Dear reader, I need you to know I have hope in us yet. So I'll stick with two. I'll come back. I'll come back. Maybe we can get thank you, Jesus, in here another time. But yeah, it's, you know, thinking about what you're reading and that 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 it struck me when you you asked the city for its love for to let you love it, you know? And I feel like I'm asking this country every day to give me something to hold on to. That, that tells me that all this hard work, all the lives that have just been spent trying to get equal rights for so many people hasn't been in vain. That this country lives up to the words etched on those monuments, you know, and that's all I ask, which is not a hard thing one would think, but yet it's so difficult and still hasn't come to fruition. So. Oh man. Um... You know, I, and here's part of the why we surrendered to this space to, to open it up to more round robin style. Cause I, I think I probably, you know, some of you know this book, know that there's a whole set of um, prose poems in here about monuments and memorials and it's very DC, but, but Terry, I kind of feel like I need to read a poem called My Whitenesses from the book, if you're okay with that. Mm -hmm. um that's kind of a little bit of a reckoning but I want to make sure are you sure I can't get you to read one more poem right now <laughs> uh you know I don't know I feel like I tell you I hold on to it I want to hear this because I, okay. I, I all right it. okay been, so, yeah. so here's the deal so I mean I think that I I think this is I, I really appreciate the hard work the labor of of Terry's book and um and I am trying to do some labor in my book as well and part of well I'm just gonna read the poem. My whiteness is whiteness as my body's spent currency, hair that holds no melanin, which I pluck out 
an overlong fingernail that I tear away. What once blistered collapsed flat to my heel, and what then? Skin picked, flicked under my bed, strands dropped the tile, the keratin crescents folded, tucked in couch crevice. My performative strip of self still trashing up the place. Down by Richmond, how you pronounce a thing set stake in the land. Do you elaborate a tribe's pow height? Or does 300 years of muscle memory guide the tongue? Po White Creek, Po White Parkway. One man uses cracker as absolution, as proof of brotherhood, while another uses cracker because someone three great grands ago cracked a whip. Virginia, my ghosts need gathering. Come to the table and sit. God damn it, sit. Uh, I think that there's a number of poems in Made to Explode that are recognizing that uh, history and kind of glosses of how things were, um, not only were aggressive and wrong, but that that continued well into a period that was congratulating itself as being liberated, as being liberal, as being um, what in reality was really self-segregated. Uh, and, and I say that as someone who grew up in a, in a fairly welcoming, um, quote unquote, inclusive environment. But on one hand, I have a great deal of affection for, and on the other hand, I am reckoning with, uh, both at, at uh, my high school, my, my college, you know, all the places I grew up in the shadow of Thomas Jefferson. But I also think that um, with this collection, I'm, you know, I, I started with food. I started with um, wanting to think about reckonings through food, which took me to history, which took me to my grandparents, which took me to larger considerations of national politics. And I will read, uh, I will, I, I'm going to read one more poem and then pause and go back because I want to hear more from Terry. Um, but this is the poem that closes the collection. It's called Epic. It takes its epigraph from C.P. Kavafi's Ithaca, and it, it mirrors that if you know that C.P. Kavafi poem. And on one hand, it's about a, someone who perpetually travels. And it is on the other hand, someone who realizes they cannot and should not attempt to be the hero of their own story. Epic, after C.P. Kavafi's Ithaca. As I set out for home, back home to my apartment, to my vengeful cat, back home to a betrothed who never was one for textile arts, I hope the voyage is a long one. I hope that Homer finds me on my great journey, on a bar stool in Ocala one March Sunday at noon. Though it occurs to me, after I am served the bowl of boiled peanuts, that my hunger in this moment is not heroic. Who am I in these stories? One by one, I shell those soft peanut bodies, warm against my bottom teeth, tipping meat into my mouth. Did they too once have names? Did they once have sons? How silly they look in their little boat with its checkered placemat sail. I take a swig of Bloody Mary, spiked with ocean and jalapeno, the one eye of my forehead pulsing. I will get back in the car. I will drive another 800 miles with Aeolius's bagged breath stashed in my glove compartment. And if I find home poor, home won't have fooled me. I who have forged a life that consists of leaving my life. I'll recall I once sat at a bar wiping Cajun broth from my chin with the 12th cocktail napkin. Blame nobody, I sang. Nobody, nobody, nobody did this to me. Well, and in, in, in the minute you said reckoning, I was like, oh, reckoning. Oh, because I, I have to think, I, I had to go to this poem, Suggest Revolution, because I'm like, that's, 
that's my that's that's and then so yeah I'm gonna go there because there is so much to say in my mind to this country um and as I think about rebirth I feel like anger is a kind of rebirth it's that fire um you know that you need to 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 scorch and then to start over um so there you go um once again just quick there's adult language in here people you can you can work through it you'll be okay i trust you um <laughs> this poem suggests revolution this poem no longer consents to play mammy or to wet nurse a seething rage at her own black teeth america your teeth have come in you nip too much this poem refuses to play religion a bible verse will not absolve you america if the pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty came from the creator, she's about ready to backhand you in the face. This poem will not be your bottom bitch, America. This poem does not consent to blackness being window dressing for the diversity brochure of a country where the board of directors never changed. This poem reads the fine print on you, America. This poem consents to be black ink, a clenched fist, pepper spray and black souls marching on asphalt, freedom for and from you, America. If need be, this poem consents to double as witness, the dotted I and the missing reparations decree. Until then, let this poem heckle you, America. Let it yell, goddamn US, choke on cotton, while fanning itself and the flames. Understand, this poem doesn't want to be bloodthirsty. It would rather write about the cleanse of a cloudburst than the vengeful force of a water hose. In truth, this poem courts hope like a volta. It wants to turn the page writing, America, let us pin a new document, not a perpetual union, but a chokehold removed as a black throat breathing freely is a self-evident truth. Let these lines be facts submitted to a candid world. And this poem, when spoken or read, let it alter, let it abolish you. And it makes me sad that every, like every time I read that poem, I have to tell you that my, my therapist told me to lean into my anger. So that allows that. But it also makes me sad as I read those last lines and I think about the current trial, the, the Derek Chauvin trial, and think about how a black throat breathing freely is a self-evident truth as we all look for justice and justice and justice. Um, so as I think too about the South, because it was a thing for me to come back down to DC. Like, yeah, those who, many people know me know that I was like a congressional page. So I was here when I was 16 and, you know, worked in the Capitol building, fell in love with DC then. But to be a Northerner and come further down, I had like all kinds of issues. I was nervous, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't like I know I, I know the north but the south it was a place of tales that scared me um but I had to think too about this way and that's there's a reason why I read this poem because it's as you mentioned Rich, Richmond and I think about the confederacy I can't help but think about um Harry Tubman you know who leading people to freedom and this poem, Knowledge of the Brown Body, which is after um, Harry Tubman is a lesbian by an incredibly great friend, Saida Agostini, great poet. And uh, she's part of my Black Ladies Brunch Collective. And we had an anthology, Not Without Our Laughter, we have an anthology. And in it, we had to respond to each other's work. And so I responded to her poem with this one, Knowledge of the Brown Body. If Harriet Tubman had been a lesbian, I would know the brown body had been valued outside of chattel to the point of risk. I would know an ebony nipple spoke its hushed volumes from inside another sweet brown mouth, eager to know its secrets. I would know a brown belly had been showered with a free tongue's pulsing intention. I would know the brown hips of a woman were stolen back for freedom's sake. I would know that brown thighs thunder was enough to make a woman walk into the abyss of the deep south and come out clapping on fire with black love. I would know that this body I own had once been coveted for its sake and its sake alone. How sacred I could hold that knowledge. I could palm it, my fingers deep inside the agent that helped break the back of the Confederacy. All right, I slide it right back to you. 
Well, and I just want to, um, oh my gosh, such great poems. Thank you. Uh, and also I, I want to remind folks that if you do want to put a question in the Q&A, we're happy to field those. I'm not seeing them so far. So um, Terry, I wonder if you and I might just spend a minute on a theme that I know we've discussed, we've both alluded to, but just, you know, this, this idea of, of grandparents of kind of calling back to that generation. I think what I might want to do, uh, I, I want to read a poem called Card Table um, that I've, you know, it, because I, it is, it does speak squarely to this constant swivel between an interior space of life in DC and this exterior space of thinking about history and inheritance. And I, I know we were talking about like, no, we don't need to end on just one poem, but I'm just going to read Card Table and kind of pause because I, I want the chance to hear if there's one that you want to read. And I also want to be sure to leave time for questions if they come in. And if, if they don't come in, then we'll just do one more round of quick poems back and forth and, and call it a day. But um, I just want to say, I, I don't know to what extent my family has been able to tune in, uh, but they might be able to watch it later. And I just want to say how grateful I am. It's very rare that I read a poem that I'm, that I'm aware in real time might be heard by family. This is one that um, I was actually able to read at my grandmother's graveside in Illinois, which meant a lot to me. So Jean, this is for you. Card table. A practical gift for moving to the city. Good cherry squared around black vinyl. Four long legs that fold within itself as a greyhound does, disappearing into a nap. Just big enough for a bridge match, if I'd ever had four people willing to kiss knees. Just big enough to let me call a corner of that S Street studio my breakfast nook. Stacked with a week's worth of newspapers while I ate cereal cross-legged on my futon just big enough to pull out every few years and complain how small the table was, too crowded as a desk, too low for my chairs. In January, we stared at the strange space wedged between two kitchen doorways. Might as well try the card table. We stacked onions there, then potatoes, then tomatoes and peaches, and it became the chopping table, stirring table, serving table. Now the first morning she is gone, I see a swipe in the vinyl where a hot dish burned through and realize I forgot to ask for anything. A ring, her sheet music. So what I have is this reminder that she too was once a girl in a city and that she knew I'd always need a table. I think the highest praise you can give a poet about a poem is that poem just makes me cry. It oh, just, it, does. it does. Cause, and it, it gave me a breakthrough moment right now about the poem I'm going to read next. And I thought, you know, as we talked about grandmothers, and I know, um, you know, we bring Saeed and we bring so many people into this conversation, like grandmothers are just everything right now to me. Um, and as I think about it, they try to give us things that they thought could be helpful to deal with whatever's coming up. And I think about it, and this is why I'm reading this poem, because both my grandmothers tried to give me that faith. And that, that faith was what got them through everything. And so it seems fitting that I would read Thank You Jesus today and call out Virgie and call out Katie May and just to thank them both for all of their sacrifices and all of their love and their guidance. So, all right, now I'm gonna try and stop crying so I can read, okay. <laughs> thank You Jesus. When the blue and red sirens pass you, when the school calls because your child beat the exam and not a classmate. When the smartphone drops but does not crack. The rush escaping your mouth betrays your upbringing. Thank you, Jesus. A balm over the wound. When the mammogram finds only density. When the playground tumble results in a bruise, not a broken bone, like steam from a hot tea kettle. Thank you, Jesus. 
and the pent up fear bends upward, out. Maybe it's a hand over breast, supplication learned deeper than flesh, as if one could shush the soul, the fluttering heartbeat with three words. Maybe it's not so dire, an almost trip on the sidewalk, the accumulated sales total showing savings upon savings. Maybe it's as small as an empty seat on the metro. Or maybe, thank you, Jesus, becomes the refrain every time your husband pulls into the driveway alive and whole and no one has mistaken him for all the black, scary things. You mutter it helpless to stop yourself from the invocation of a grandmother who gave you your first Bible. You say it because your mother, even knowing your doubt as a vested commodity, still urges prayer. You learned early to cast the net. Thank you, Jesus. And it's a sweet needle that gathers the fraying thread, hemming security in steady stitches. From birth, you've heard this language. As an adult, You've seen religion used nakedly as ambition, yet this sacrifice of praise still slips past your lips, this lyrical martyr of your dying faith. Okay, so yeah, I had to, as you were reading that, it was like the beam of light came into my head. It was a certain slant of light. And all of a sudden I could, I could see it. And I was like, oh goodness, my grandmothers really did try to pass on, on faith. And that was, I mean, my, my Katie Mae was always sneaking them into packages. Just, I couldn't, and you know, it was always, did you pray? And did you, and I was like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble if I say no. Um, like, <laughs> but you know, yeah. Oh my gosh. And I have to laugh because I, you know, Nancy, uh, Naomi Carlson was kind enough to ask a question about what do you like about this format? This is it. This is it right here. <laughs> you know, like, I mean, uh, and and I just want to credit, um, you know, the um, not without our laughter and and the collective because I, I I know I heard you use that format at the Arts Club of Washington when you read from the anthology and I was like yes this is how readings ought to be a lot more column response a lot less oh wait did I tune in and miss the half that I thought I was gonna hear <laughs> like I, right. I, yeah 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 this is this is much more fun. Um, and, you know, one of the other questions, Terry, and, and I might have spotted it before you did, so I'm mentioning this in part to give you time, was whether, you know, we had, like, favorite poems of each other's work. Uh, and, and I'll just say, you know, just to elaborate a little bit, like, I, I, I was fortunate enough to teach paint, and I, and I have taught, you know, Terry's work before. But one thing that it's fine that we didn't get it to it in this reading, although I would encourage you to tune in to other readings of Terry's to get it, is we didn't get the Prince poems, right? Oh. And I think that that is such a beautiful, glorious subset. And actually one of my favorite ones, if I had to name a favorite one, it would maybe be the cross section where Prince goes into the goddess poems with the goddess of lust, which uses the, the epigraph um, of a Prince line, uh, which I don't know about, did you see him when he played here in DC? He oh yeah. Did things oh yeah all of them oh yeah oh yeah no there was one tour where we saw him in dc and then we drove and saw him in cleveland too because he always puts on a great show in dc well yeah. and i keep even making it present tense and he would always put on a great show in cleveland um and so i i knew it would be worth it and i had parents who are prince fans so that you know that was my 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 gateway drug in many ways to rock um <laughs> other than yeah. that, Led Zeppelin and Jimi Hendrix, but whatever. Um, but yeah, so there, there are some great, there are some great questions here in, in the Q&A. So folks, thanks so much. And, and meanwhile, we're having like a little AU reunion in the Q&A. Natalie, Ilya, Natalie's there, Jonah Jonah, Wilson, yep. I was like, yay. Yeah, Leslie, Leslie, yeah. Leslie. No, we got yes, yes. So, you know, it's like, we're like a walking, talking, like ad for AU's MFA program. <laughs> Well, but you know, one, one question, Terry, that popped up in the Q&A was, were we writing about DC when we were MFA students? And that's an interesting question because I do, there are a few poems in Theories of Falling, which is my first collection, that are very much, I live in DuPont Circle. I live in a fishbowl at 18th and S, you know, that same S Street studio that pops up in Card Table. And, and, and so in that sense, yes, I was writing about living in DC because I was writing about where I was living, but mm. I don't know if I had a handle to talk about DC as a, you know, it, that's a tough needle to thread writing about DC. <laughs> it is. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it, yeah. 
Yeah, I, in the end, I, you know, it comes up. It comes up more. It didn't come up in hate that much. Um, but there is a poem I did write um, um, about the about the DC shooter. You know, so there's a poem there. Um, yeah, and, or or a different shooter. Um, oh no, and the one that's in your in your book too. Um, we both talked about that one because that, that is a weird thing to have in common. Yes, we both no, have right? sniper poems. <laughs> exactly, a sniper poem. It's just like that's the trauma, though, and it was like yeah. the trauma we all lived under. Um, and then it comes up, but it, it comes up more in this one. I realize as I go through um, the, the the you know my my work, it's a lot of Cleveland. Cleveland comes up more than DC. And I think because it, it put its stamp so, so deeply on me. Um, and it's, it's the rust from the iron, I swear. Um, and, and then, you know, my time in Kenya comes up. Um, but, and, and now in this one, my time in Ireland comes up. But DC is making its way in there um, because it's always had a place in my heart. I mean, go go music. I mean, like, like you just, yeah, mumbo sauce. I mean, like, there are just certain things you're just like, yes. <laughs> Yes, I need to come back to these things that I love. Um, but what I love too was your poems about visiting the monuments at night. That's yeah. that's those. I was like, oh my gosh, what a beautiful way to kind of like integrate an, a more intimate and emotional response to these huge, you know, monuments cast in stone. Um, and there's just the intimacy that comes across. There's like a real intimacy to me in those poems. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I come back to those a lot. Um, so, well, let me. Um, I I am torn between. I I want to speak to that. I also, for those of you who know me, my cat is attacking the flowers my parents brought me for the reading right now. So I'm getting a little bit of pet drama, which is always exciting. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so let me let me just say about the the monuments and memorial poems. I. It's interesting that my DC section in this book has the prose poems, which I, is not a mode I work in often. And then the one Sestina, which is a mode that I, that I am passionate about and return to over and over. And in a weird way that the Sestina, to, talk, to use the Sestina to talk about DC had me thinking about DC as an iterative bureaucratic town, a place where everything's cyclical, everything that has happened will happen again. But the prose poems were very much about flattening decoration. Uh, I, I really, you know, the whole point was to interrogate the way that stories get lifted, but then also edited and cropped often to their mm -hmm. most quote unquote flattering versions when they get inscribed to stone, right? You know, and that's, that's how that discussion of figures like Jefferson and Lincoln and, you know, it, it's meant to, Roosevelt, um, it's meant to kind of poke holes in, in what we end up knowing about them on the grade school level versus what they did. So for me, um, for me, the prose poem was an appropriate vessel. And then I'll also mention that the title convention that, you know, Roosevelt Midnight, Lincoln Midnight, in a way, I think that's the nod to the locals. Cause we all go, if we're gonna go at all, you go in the middle of the night. To me, at least, that, that's when you can go. That's when you can go and not have to deal with traffic or cops or tourists or, you know, you just, you park and you walk up. Maybe it's with someone who's visiting. Maybe it's just when you're escaping. I can, I can remember a few past relationships where I was like, I'm just going to the memorial at like midnight or one in the morning. And I, that was my, that was my escape route. So, um, which might just mean I'm very, very nerdy, but, uh, but anyway, it, the <laughs> The point is, is that, yeah, um, just to, to answer some of the questions that popped up in the chat, my, my choices of form are really organic. They are really activated by content. And, uh, and the prose poem is an exciting form to me. It's one that I'm just starting to really think about and write critically about. Um, I'm curious for you, Terry, were there, were there formal kind of decisions that you locked into for this collection that felt new or felt important? Um, I think I fell in love with the couplet all over again you know <laughs> like so there is that um there are a couple times where I tried out just something fun with like varying my stances like um in backup it starts off with like I think a seven a seven line stance and then it just deteriorates because I wanted it to mirror the interior deterioration of the black woman's body 
through all the abuse from the social economic conditions and the racism in America. So we go from, you know, seven lines to like one um, <laughs> throughout the whole poem. But, um, you know, like I found myself playing with sonnets in the first one, like I did a sonnet there. But for me, really, it was, um, it was the goddess poems were the ones who dictated their shape. Um, so much of them were about you know, giving command and, and taking and taking control. Um, and so I had to find a form that felt like it was uh, close to what you would find written in stone tablets on the mountain. Like I wanted it to be that declarative voice, like, yes, I'm telling you what to do. Here's how to honor me. And there, I'm not brokering any conversation. And, and that's why it's like all of them just take command. And I love the power in that. So yeah, you know, you, your poems tell you what to write in. You know, I'm looking at Mary's question. Your poems tell you. They 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 let you know. Um, some of them, like White Barbie, didn't feel right until I put it in couplets. Um, all of a sudden, there was space in there that that wasn't there before. Um, so yeah, so they they tell you they tell you what they want. Yeah. Um, and just to, um, you know, and I'm seeing, and, and thank you all for these thoughtful questions. Uh, I, I feel like Terry, since we've alluded a few times to American, and I'm even seeing like um, Monica and some other additional folks pop up in the chat. Hello, uh, poets <laughs> that poets that we would consider a mentor, poets that influenced. You know, one of one of the things that I don't think people often know is that like Cornelius Eady, for example, came through. Um, Myra Slaru, like I mean, Ooh. gosh. Can we just do a yes. whole session on the wonder that it's Myra Sclaru? <laughs> exactly. exactly. Myra Sclaru as the woman who really taught me to appreciate translation. Yes. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, and, and really, wow. and think about it for a minute. You know, you you have gone on to have such a distinguished service as the head of the, the OB Hardison series, the planner for the OB Hardison series. And that, you know, because you appreciate poetry and translation, world poetry because of Myra, that is subsequently infused into the series, right? And so like that that really does have a larger impact on DC as a poetry town, but also what you've been able to do. Yeah, and I have to I always have to call out uh, Lucille Clifton um, because <laughs> her work and her voice uh, gave me such a stepping stone to feel empowered and validated to take on and develop and blossom into my own voice. Um, and and Linda Paston and Rita Duff. Mm -hmm. like, those are always and yeah. Edith Nolan too. It's like there's like a a circle of angels. You know, like, well, they're like a circle of angels uh, above me. Yeah. It's like oh my gosh. When I moved to Macomb in Wisconsin, which I don't live there anymore, so I'm not giving I'm there. But but I went to two Amy's and I saw Linda Paston because of course that's a family connection. Eating pizza. And I was like, I'm in the right place to work on my poems. There's poems here, just poets just hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, Myra, Henry Taylor, uh, mm -hmm. Cornelius, Richard McCann, who of oh course gosh. is a poet yeah. and route to, to, to writing prose. Um, and, and yeah, I, I, in terms of previous to American, I was so fortunate to be mentored by, by Rita Dove and, and Gregory Orr and uh, Lisa Raspar and others at UVA. And the only reason why I mention that is that I am teaching Rita Dove's work for politics and prose. Hannah was nice enough to blurt out that I, you know, I, I, I teach for them sometimes, which is both terrifying and super exciting. So, mm -hmm. um, so Terry, I would say, I think that we both really appreciate poets who have a, a flair for form. They have the ability for formal rigor and the excitement for it, even if they choose primarily to work in, in free verse. Does that seem fair? Oh, I would say that's fair. There's also a thing I just, I love, you know, I love poets who are shaking the language up and who are invigorating it and turning it around and making me feel something new when I read their work out loud, um, feel it in my mouth, you know, just from the, the combination of words together. But it's just, yeah, there's so much that invigorates me. But yeah, I, I you know, all the people that we've mentioned as mentors, definitely. Um, and I always have to thank Henry Taylor for actually making me apply to AU. Because um, <laughs> that was just a weird moment, <laughs> like at an open mic. And he was like, hey, have you ever thought about AU? And I was like, uh, no, I hadn't until you said something, sir. Was that the days of Henry turning up to open mics in like a a bow tie and sports jacket. <laughs> yes, I've heard yeah. it. 
because <laughs> you're just like, well, um, okay, sir. Yes. Um, so yeah. Oh, but uh, this has been great. And I see Hannah, you're back. And, but, you know, thank you all for your questions. I, you know, there's not much I can say for, for writing practice right now during this pandemic, because I, I, I need, I need time away. I'm a mom of two. I have a 10 year old and a tween who's always on me to join TikTok. And I think I'm finally going to submit. Gosh, pray for me, people. Pray for me. Um, and <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I need to get away. Uh, <laughs> so I'm just, I, it's been so stunted. I need to get away. I've written, but I don't have time to revise. And that's just the hardest part right there. Um, but I, Hannah, yeah. you're back. No, it is. Um, but thank you guys so much, so, so much. This was lovely. And I think that everyone in the comments have just been saying that they have enjoyed this so much. Um, as have I, both of you really have shown lights in your work in different ways than even when I was just reading it, you showed it in a totally different like perspective, which was lovely. Thank you both so much. Um, different things that you as the audience can know. Um, thank you for joining us. You guys can always follow us on social medias and different things like that. You can find out more events that are coming up on our website. We always have them up on that calendar. So join us for new talks, different talks, things that are like this too. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Thank you guys for taking the time. And I think that we're good. Bye y'all. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Thanks, Terry. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. This was fun. Bye.